Welcome to the sixth episode uh, of part two of artificial intelligence here at NYU, uh, 11 a.m. New York City Live. So what have we been talking about these days? We started looking at classification, so our first instance of machine learning. Uh, we saw in the first lessons a model-based type of classifier where we were learning a joint distribution probability of a random variable. And then we were using that joint distribution to ask questions about posteriors, like about uh, conditional probabilities, in order to make a decision. We could actually move in the log space and then we were summing these negative numbers. And then to pick the winner, we didn't even have to go back to the probability realm. This log space is very uh, convenient. Uh, moreover, the multiplications were converted into uh, additions. Then we move forward to the uh, kind of, I would say, non-model base where we were learning uh, directly how to perform a classification task. For linearly separable data, we saw that the perceptron was learning these weights, which were eventually going to converge to a specific solution to those points. And so it was able to find a decision boundary, which was able to separate these points that were linearly separable. Uh, now the issue was that if the points were not linearly separable, the perceptron keeps you know, flopping around with this decision boundary. And moreover, we also saw that the perceptron doesn't necessarily find a nice decision boundary as if points are here, the decision boundary could be completely like uh, non-orthogonal, right? Like not in this way, uh, because as soon as the, the, there is a decision boundary, which does classify all the data points correctly, then we said don't change, right? Remember the perceptual learning rule? If it's wrong, fix it, right? Add or subtract the feature to the weight. If it's correct, don't touch. Therefore, you might end up getting a decision boundary, which is, I mean, it is correct, but then it will not generalize because if the training set is kind of representative of the test set, but then you got this kind of decision boundary, which is really close to the training points, it might happen that the testing point end up on the wrong side of the fence, right? What we saw also the multi-class perception where we had one weight per specific class. And then what was the learning rule there? First the inference to perform our prediction, we were checking the inner product with all the weights. And then we ch to check the argmax, which one is the highest weight, uh, the winning weight, right? The, the, the class with the highest inner product is the uh, prediction, the one I assign my input point to that specific class. Was that a correct uh, assignment? Don't do anything. We already know about this. If it's incorrect assignment, then we had to subtract the feature from that specific weight and then add the feature to the correct way, right? Such that the next time, maybe we get the classification done correctly. Then, yeah, I was telling you about the problem of uh, weekly, you know, jumping around um, decision boundary and the fact that this decision boundary might be, get very close to the data points. So we introduced the probabilistic uh, augmentation, if you want, of this perception. We assign a probability, like a degree of belief that this point belongs to a specific class rather than this point belongs to a class, this point doesn't belong, right? So we have now this degree of belonging. How do we find these parameters? Okay, that, that's where we kind of, uh, I didn't, I mean, I told you how we should be finding. So we have the uh, likelihood. So the likelihood is the probability, in this case, the conditional probability of the Y given the X as a function of the parameters of the model. So how do we find these weights? Well, we maximize the likelihood, okay? or the log likelihood because it's easier. Uh, so by finding the arg max of the log likelihood, we find the weight that assign the highest probability to the targets given my observations. I also had to say one thing when we switch from the classical perceptron algorithm in the, in the binary case that uh, always finds a, a decision boundary for linear separable uh, data. This is no longer, uh, this guarantee does not hold when we switch to the probabilistic uh, perspective. When we switch to the probabilistic uh, version, uh, that's called logistic regression. Why? I don't know, that's a very bad choice of uh, <laughs> words, but we are you're gonna use these words because that's what people use. Although I completely, I don't think it's completely nailed. We, we switch to the probabilistic version of this single class or multi-class perception, which they become, they are known as logistic regression or multi-class logistic regression, okay? Still one weight or multiple weights, but now we have to figure out how to find the weights. 
how do we find the weights? I just said, repeat, how do we find the weights? Type in the chat. <laughs> Is anyone listening? <laughs> You're listening, yes, and I'm not muted, right? You can hear me, but <laughs> okay. Let me actually go to the last slide of yesterday. This is the, the classical uh, perception that we say we assign probabilities, right? And so how we do that, we were basically using the sigmoid function that goes from zero to one. And that is kind of a gradual uh, assignment, right? You don't have zero, one It's like a degree of assignment belief right and so we said this was giving uh, us the ability to say these points are you know kind of 0.5 i don't know exactly where to assign them uh here instead you're gonna be having almost one these are definitely red the other one are uh, definitely zero how do we find the the w right so that was the question i ask you right now so how do we find the, the w and this is the answer right the W is going to be the parameter, the weight that are maximizing my uh, likelihood. What is this likelihood? Is the, uh, well, this is the log likelihood, but it doesn't matter because we are maxing, so it's the same. So the likelihood was the product, right, of all these uh, probabilities, these conditional probabilities, right? And so we want to find the parameter that are maximizing the probability that the model, this is the parametric probability, right? This is the probability that the model assigns to the targets given the inputs, right? This is for the binary class. And we said the probability is defined by this uh, sigmoid function, right? The one I showed you before. And so we had to find this, the solution to this maximization problem. Are, are we understanding? Are we following? Yes, no? Yeah, okay, good. Complain if you're not following, right? As, as usual, because I don't know how much you <laughs> follow talk back. Otherwise, I, I don't know how fast or how slow I should go. Uh, so here we were also mentioning the fact that this thing here, uh, what is the problem with this thing, right? This thing assigns a lower probability to this guy and to this guy, right? Whereas this decision boundary assign uh, equally high probability to all these points. One can say, oh, it is uh, lower for this one, it's higher for this one. Yes, but we are actually considering the log probability, right? So if you are considering the log probability, uh, if you get like a smaller probability, you got a much, much negative uh, number, right? So this is the decision boundary that is maximizing the probability that the model assigns to the labels for these data points. Okay. And then we saw the multi-class case where we were having one weight per class. We were doing the multiple inner products and the prediction was the arg max of these multiple inner products. These are the location where the inner product is the maximum. How can we convert these inner product, these scores into probability? Then we saw we can use this kind of formulation where we take each of these scores, we take the exponential and divide it by the sum such that if you sum the three, you're going to get one. Uh, each of these things is positive, right? And this is called, these are the original linear activations and the right-hand side, I call them soft argmax uh, activation. Again, and people outside this class will mistakenly miss to use these three letters here. Why is this important? I'll tell you next lesson. I know I've been telling you, postponing, but <laughs> it is important. The question was, how do we find the best uh, uh, weights? Find best weight, we have to, this is the same equation as before, nothing changed. What changed? The expression, how we uh, parameterize this probability, right? What is this probability? In this case, was this again, the exponential of the specific class divided by the sum of all the exponentials. Again, there is a coldness here, which we don't care, right, for now. So again, forget about the coldness for now. I just put it there because, you know, <laughs> it might be helpful for your programming assignment number four. Okay, but I explained to you, don't worry. And this is called multi-class logistic regression, whereas the one before was called, I didn't press uh, <laughs> logistic regression, sorry. Okay, my dad, finally, okay, today's lesson, that, that's where we left off last time. Well, next today lesson, optimization. How do we solve this arg maximization problem? Can we solve it analytically? No. Either you can try all possible weights, they have infinite amount of <laughs> trials, or we can do something more smart. That is what we're going to learn today. But 
the overall point is gonna be that we have to search oh search remember search but that's we spent like so many weeks in the first part of the semester we have to search for a uh for what i have to search for for this weight right but there is a caveat right what is the caveat i'm gonna tell you now next slides all right questions so far right this is recap i spent like 15 minutes recapping things no no one has a question very good i mean i hope that you are on page on the same page okay moving forward because we cannot go backward okay there we go boom i said i was not going to use more these slides okay last time i used these slides i already made new slides for next lesson don't worry uh i actually do work as well <laughs> no i've been able okay the jokes aside i've been uh, heavily editing these slides right because uh yeah i i i, I had changed all the notation Okay, so again, borrow slides from Berkeley with heavily uh, updated notation, uh, optimization, artificial intelligence. Okay, sweet. Let's figure out how this works. So hill climbing, remember when we were talking about heuristic search or informed search, we could evaluate a function to figure out in what direction more or less uh, to proceed to, to search or something, right? So we start wherever you want. Uh, repeat, move to the best neighboring state. Okay, so, sounds pretty uh, logical. Good. If there are no neighbors better than current, quit. Okay, sweet. What's particularly tricky when we do hill climbing for multi-class logistic regression? Well, there is a few problems here. First of all is optimization over a continuous space. Ouch. Okay, we haven't talked about that. Well, we mentioned, but we haven't really done anything. So things uh, seem to be slightly different. Uh, oh, ouch, right? There are infinitely many neighbors. I'm in a specific point. I'm a specific vector. Now, what are my neighbors? Everything is my neighbor. That sounds kind of daunting right now. So how to do this efficiently? Well, actually, it turns out that since this stuff is continuous, right, the space is continuous, we have a tool that we didn't have for discrete spaces, which is going to be very convenient, which is going to also tell us in what direction to go, to go uphill okay let's figure out how this works calculus yeah we love calculus i mean i do all right one d optimization this is just to give you the uh intuition about how this works i only have one weight that is on this uh, horizontal axis and then on the uh, vertical axis i'm going to be plotting my g function which is the uh scalar function like a, a function which we'd like to maximize, right? Because for example, this could represent our log likelihood or likelihood for which we would like to find, what do we want to find of our likelihood, log likelihood? Tell me in the chat. Max, why do I want to find the max of the log likelihood? Well, we have, I want to find the location of the RTS, correct. Why do I want to find the, the location? Yeah, because that location would be the location which assigns the highest probability to my Ys given the X. Okay, good. So we said in the hill climbing, we start wherever, okay, like there. And we can, for example, say what is the height of this function G. Okay, cool. Now, I could possibly, you know, I, I start at W0, I, I look on the, on, the, on the right, I look on the left, I see that going to the, to the right, it actually goes upwards, right? And so then I might step towards the right to go up the hill, right? Sounds legit. So I step in the best direction, sweet. Otherwise, I could do something else. I could evaluate the derivative, which tells me the direction to uh, step into, right? So this is just the definition, the, the derivative of the function G, right? This is, I'm reading this thing here. The derivative of the function G with respect to its argument evaluated at the W0, right? So this is, the derivative is evaluated at this location, okay? So this is simply the limit of looking at right, looking at left, uh, take the difference divided by two times the difference, the, the, how, much time, how much space you look right and left. And we find that for, for G, that if G has a closed form and whatever, we also have like the tables to compute these derivatives. All right, both options work in 1D. In high dimensional space, it's more complicated because if I am in two dimensions, I have to check now 
for two directions, right? I had to sum one step in one direction. I see it goes up and down. Okay, I check the other direction goes to. If I go three, four, five, so on, I have to check so many uh, directions and see whether the, the 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 function goes up and down. Whereas this formulation here exactly tells me in what direction the the function goes up. Okay, so it's going to be more convenient to use the second formulation, but they are in principle equivalent. Just one takes more. Okay, so 2D, now it becomes a little bit more uh, appropriate towards what we are trying to do. We are actually much higher than 2D, but more than 2D, I cannot draw in a, on a screen, right? Because, okay, screens are 2D. Okay, uh, so gradient ascent, how does it work? So perform update in a uphill direction for each coordinate, okay? So it turns out that if you go up in each coordinate, you will go up globally. Uh, this is something that we, we decide to do. The steeper the slope, the meaning the highest the derivative, and then the bigger the step I would like to do, right? Why is the case? Because if I already reach the uh, the top, right? So let me go back here. If I am already over here, let's say close to this direction, what is the derivative over here? Roughly zero, yeah, good. So if I'm basically almost zero, that means, oh, you, you, you arrive. So if the derivative is basically zero, don't move much, right? If instead I am uh, halfway through here, which the, I have the highest derivative, oh, well, move, you can climb a lot, right? So we will make this decision of stepping uh, proportionally to the uh, derivative, okay? Bigger the step uh, for the highest slope, okay? But like hill climbing, would this settle in local optima? Absolutely, yes. And actually we, yes, yes, that's totally correct. And so we, well, we, back 20 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, we thought this was one of the major issues with possibly training neural networks. So we were scared of local uh, minima. But then it turns out if you increase the number of parameters and you make these networks, but we haven't talked about neural network yet. But again, if you increase the number of parameters, things get easier and easier. And this local maxima, they actually get converted in a, a subtle point. More about that in a future lesson when we talk about neural networks. But yes, totally correct. We could get stuck possibly, right? If we are doing uh, things with a small number of parameters. Okay. So let's consider this multivariate function. So we have this scalar field function of two coordinates, W1, W2. And we're gonna be performing the following update, right? So this is my, this function here. The G is the height of this thing here. And the yellowing, the more the yellow, like the, the more yellow color, the highest, the, the height, right? So it shows you the height in three ways here. Uh, one way of, see, of seeing the height is to, see how high this picture is. But since it's a 3D, 3D picture on a 2D uh, screen, it's a bit hard to understand. That's why there are colors that are showing you the uh, altitude, basically, of, the, uh, of this function. What exactly is the G function on which you are performing gradient descent? Uh, currently, just made up functions. Eventually, it's going to be the log likelihood we mentioned before, right? So our objective from the previous deck of slide is to find the weight that is giving me the highest probability for my observed data point, right? That's the ultimate goal that we're going to be doing in a few minutes. Currently, I'm just coming up with, in this case, a quadratic uh, function just to make things, uh, you know, easy to understand and digest first. Raul, does it make sense? Yes, no? Yeah, okay. No, 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 Lisa, Raul, Raul, like, hold on, I'm <laughs> talking to one person. This is going to be my uh, scalar function. What's a scalar function? It's a function that maps, in this case, 2D coordinate, the one that moves up, up and down this direction, the one that goes up and down this direction to an altitude. Uh, again, the yellow is high color, the highest, the, the blue is the lowest point. These are the, this is the shape of the function. If you move around, let's say this um, this direction, you're going to be going up. It's like a parabola, right? You go up and then down, boom. If you move around this direction, let's say we go here and go up and down. Also, this is a parabola. Moreover, you have here some uh, level lines, which are again drawn with the same color of the altitude, telling you 
if you move in the W space, right? This is the W space in two, two dimensions. You can see that moving towards the yellow area, you're going to be basically moving to the top of my uh, G function, right? If you're moving towards the blue area, you're going to be basically uh, falling down, right? So we may use usually this uh, representation in the, in the W space where the altitude is represented by the contour line, right? Basically. So we were considering this function. I just show it to you and the following update. So how do we go up here? Well, for a specific initial W1, update, so this means gets, right? This is like a re assignment in, in code. W1 becomes W1 plus, this is a partial derivative, right? So this is the derivative of the G with respect to the first coordinate evaluated at the current W1, W2 point, right? So this is actually a point where we currently are, and this is the uh, partial derivative of this function with respect to the first coordinate. Why is the case, right? Because if the derivative is, is positive, then you want to follow uh, that direction, like you want to sum that direction to move in a higher direction, right? So let, let's go check on the picture, right? Uh, the axis here is gonna uh, orient it from left to right, right? So at this location over here, what is the derivative, negative or positive? along W1, this is W1, positive, right? So if the derivative along this direction is positive, then I want to go up to this direction, right? To the, to the right side of in W1, right? Okay, both are positive in this case. So for the, this is for the first coordinate, and then for the second coordinate, do the same, right? So the second coordinate will be updated by taking the current value of current position, and then some, some fraction of the, partial derivative of my G function with respect to the so second coordinate evaluated at the W1, W2 location. So now we are looking at this derivative. Is this positive or negative? Look at the axis, right? So the, this is the negative side of the axis. This is positive side of the axis. So both of these are uh, positive deriv derivatives. So eventually when you do a step, you're going to be stepping basically really ac actually uh, upwards, right? If I'm here, I will step up this way. If I am basically on the other side over here, I will step this direction, right? So I will step to the right side. So in this case here, the derivative with respect to the W2 over here would be negative, right? Because it goes down when I increase W2. And so in this case, I would like to go come back, right? But then we just sum the derivative. The derivative is negative. I sum a negative number, I come back, right? So I'm here, I move to the left. I'm over here on the negative side of the derivative, I move to the right. Are you following everyone? Okay, does anyone not understand what's going on? Okay, I move forward. So basically we sum to our W this uh, fraction of the derivative such that we can move to a highest point. Uh, instead of copying this for as many indexes as I have, I can just use a compact notation. So this is going to be a vector notation where I just simply my, say my vector W becomes W plus a fraction. And this is going to be the symbol that represents like this uh, nabla W, G, W, this thing is a vector that collects all the partial derivatives. And this is called a gradient. But anyway, the point here says that instead of just writing one expression at a time, I just write all of them, becomes all of them plus a fraction of all the partials. A computed ID, like partial with respect to the one, the second, third, and so on. But this was maybe too, uh, too, too high level. Therefore, I, I created uh, this additional slide. So in this case, I have my G function of two variables, W1, W2, that are my two weights, for example, directions. It's going to be the sign of the first uh, weight plus 1 20th times the squared second direction, okay? So this is going to be my G, right? My G function over W1, W2 looks like that. Over W1 looks like a, a sign function, right? Is the graph on the right, the G graph? It's written over here, right? The G, W, did I answer your question? It's, it's written on the slide. 
So this G function, right, is here over here. I just use the W, the ball W to express these two coordinates, right? So if you see along W1, it looks like a sign for zero is zero, then it goes to it goes up, then it goes down, then around two pi, it keeps going, it goes back to the original zero, right? And so on. And then if you look at the W2 coordinate, it looks like a parabola. Okay, it goes up. I mean, very open parabola. I put at 1 over 20 here, such that it's going to be very flat. I'm a little confused. Let me see. Since we were updating the weights using perceptrons before, which means we have a final weight function after training perception. Why do we still need to update W here? Is this weight something different than we used before? So perceptron was a binary classifier. Then we move from a binary classifier to the probabilistic extension, the probabilistic augmentation, how, you can, how we can call this thing. Like from, from the binary classifier, which is either telling you zero or one, we switch to the probabilistic uh, version. And then to find the weights for the probabilistic version, we had to, to do the maximum likelihood estimate. We had to figure out what are the weights that are giving us the largest probabilities. So the perception doesn't require this stuff. Whenever we switch to the probabilistic model, which assigns to the point a probability rather than the like simply the binary option, then we, we need to uh, use gradient ascent, okay? Okay, sure. But do, do review the previous lessons, right? You have all the recordings. If things are not clear, I mean, if you need to, li to listen to the things, to the, what I say multiple times, you can just rewatch the lessons. All right. The perceptron algorithm itself gets the weights vector, but for the probabilistic case, we compute it. The perceptron, I mean, you, you did the, the homework assignment. You start with some weights, and then you have to update the weights with the perceptron rule. If you're... You have the initial weight, you observe one sample at a time, and you update the, the, the weight based on the fact that the perceptron makes a mistake or not. That was the perceptron. Then we switch to logistic regression, where we have a probability as an output. Now we would like to find the weights that are giving the maximum probability for the observed data set. That's called likelihood. So we want to maximize the likelihood of the model, meaning we have, want to find the weights that are better describing my training set. Okay. So how we were doing the thing. So the first point is going to be, I start a at a random location. Let's say uh, my initial W, I write W0 is going to be the 0.45. So the 0.45 is going to be this uh, cyan point down here. Okay. Then I can evaluate the G function at 4, 5. If you replace 4, 5 here, so 4 here and then 25 over here, you compute the two things, you get point, point 0.5, basically, point 0.49, which is the height of the cyan point. So the, the W1, W2 is going to be set to 4 and 5. You can see this is 5 and this is basically 4. And then the height of this point is point 0.5, basically. Then I can compute the partial derivative of this thing with respect to the first uh, component, which is going to be uh, cosine of W1. I compute the partial derivative of G with respect to the second component. I get two times W2 times 0 0.05, which is going to be 0 0.10, right? Or 0 0.1 times W2. And then I can evaluate these partial derivatives that are functions at the four phi location. If I evaluate these partial derivatives at the four phi location, I will get cosine of four, which is negative uh, 0 0.65. And then if I multiply, if I evaluate the second thing at five, you have five times 0 0.1, you're gonna get 0 0.5, right? So this is the value of the gradient. Now, what do you have to do? Tell me, what do I have to do with this gradient? What do we use the gradient for? Add to W0. That's very good. All right, let's do that together, right? So I have that W1 is going to be W0 plus, in this case, I just sum this gradient over here. And so now I the new point the, that I get is going to be this yellow point over here. 
which uh, has coordinate 3.35, right? And then it's going to be 5.5, right? If I can do math to <laughs> math uh, on the on the spot, uh, I think it is correct. Uh, then if I evaluate the G function at the new location that I obtain over here, I will get 1.31. And so we saw that basically we move from the, the G at the initial, initial location was 0.5. And now G at the new location is going to be 1.31. By following the gradient, we increase the value that the scalar function takes. How does it look in this case? The idea is the following. We start somewhere, for example, over here, W0, and then we repeat by following the direction of the steepest ascent, which is the gradient. So if I follow the gradient, next step, I get there. I follow the gradient, so I sum the gradient, and I go down there. And as you can see, these steps are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Why are these steps getting smaller? less steep yes absolutely that's uh, the gradient is becoming uh shorter and shorter and shorter and then eventually the stuff doesn't push anymore anything uh, it just shrunk all right sweet what's going to be the generic case well the generic case is going to be having n-dimensional weights right uh, can i draw it on the screen no okay so let, let's use our imagination which doesn't really work in high dimensional space okay so anyway we're going to be dealing with this gradient which is a vector. You can see the nabla here is a, is a bold symbol. And again, it represents this collection of all the partial derivatives. So now it's going to be a little bit of notation. First one, the optimization procedure answering the question I got before in chat. So this is for the generic G function. We start by a random initial W. Then we do the following for each iteration or epoch in this case, one, two, three, so on. Update my current weight by summing a fraction of the gradient of the G function. So what is this fraction I'm talking about? So this is called the learning rate. What is this learning rate? This is how much proportional, like what is the scaling factor you want to use to change, modulate the, uh, the gradient. So the learning rate, uh, tweaking parameter that needs to be chosen carefully, right? Why? Why? Because if you step too large, you might overshoot and you end up on the other side of the of the of the of the space. Uh, if it's too tiny, you don't move, right? So you have to figure out what is the appropriate learning rate. How to do that? Well, it's an empirical question. So how do we do? We try multiple iteration, but more or less. Uh, it should basically account for a tenth to a hundredth of my weight, right? So the update should be, again, changing uh, by uh, one to 10% my current position, more or less, such that if people will change this G, but then you still use the eta proportional to the weight, doesn't matter, right? And otherwise, if one takes this G multiplies by a thousand, then you get this term that become blows up, right? But again, if this is just again makes sure the step is proportional to the like is a fraction of w, then it's all good. So the learning rate is hard coded. Yes, uh, it's a hyperparameter which you can play with. Okay, many things you can play in machine learning. One of which learning rate. Then there is rate uh, learning rate scheduling, and there is a, a simulated annealing. So there are way many ways of figuring out these uh, these parameters, and there are sci there is science about it. There are heuristics about it. There is a, a lot of tweaking. Uh, machine learning is a lot of tweaking. Okay. All right, batch gradient ascent. So this is the actual thing that uh, we do that is making like is one to one translation of what we covered uh, so far. So we would like to do this gradient ascent, which we name it batch in this specific case, but for now, it's just gonna be gradient ascent on the log likelihood objective. So how does it work? So I just replace uh, G with this thing, right? So before we were arg maximizing G, and now we are still arg maximizing G, where G is the sum of all the logs, right? This was the log of the product of, of the P and the product and the log, uh, you swap them, it becomes uh, summation, the logs. So sum of the logs of these P's. 
Uh, and this is a scalar function, right? So this is a scalar number. Uh, you take the log, you can be a negative number, right? Because these are from zero and one, then you have a bunch of, of these numbers. But it's not just number, right? These are functions, right? Remember, we got the two options for the logistic regression. We had the, the sigmoid, and then for the multi-class, we have the soft max. So first we say we initialize with this random W second for many iterations, so epoch one, two, three, and so on. Update my current W by adding to it a fraction of, I, I took out the, the, the sum from the gradient, right? It's a linear operator. The sum of all these gradients, right? I put the gradient here and the gradient can be uh, flipped, right? With the sum, we don't care. So you have the sum of the gradients of all the log probs. And so this is exactly what we were doing here, right? I just copy, I just change the symbols. So here we are saying update the W by adding to it a fraction of the gradient of the G function. Now I say the G function is this sum of logs of probabilities, right? sum of log probabilities. How do we determine where the epoch ends? In my previous knowledge, an epoch is equal to one pass through the... Oh, no, no, no. So this is the uh, batch gradient descent, okay? So I'm getting now to, to this point. So give me like 10 minutes. Uh, if I haven't answered your question in the next three slides, then ask this question again, okay? I'm getting there. Good, Matthew? Okay, all right. So first point is this uh, thing where we have our G function, which is the sum of the log probs. And then I update my weight by the fraction of the sum of the uh, gradients of the log probs, okay? Again, I swap the order of these two operators because it doesn't matter. The gradient is a linear operator. Next, so now maybe I guess I, I answered the question. Stochastic gradient ascend, SGA. So what is this thing doing? Observation, once gradient on the training example has been computed, might as well incorporate before computing the next one. So what we say here is that I pick a random J, which is the index of a random sample, and then I update my weight by just the gradient of that specific log prob, okay? Before the batch gradient ascent, I was updating the W with a fraction of the sum of all the gradients for all the data points, so the log probability of all the data points. Now, they are switching to the stochastic. I'm picking just one random sample and I'm updating my weight based on the fraction of a gradient of a single log prob. And so now going, as you're saying, going through the whole data set, now it makes sense, right? Because now we are picking one data point at a time and then we can go through the entire data set. Before, we were using all data points, computing all the gradients, summing up all the gradients and updating the weight by that summation, okay? Now we are updating the weight with each gradient for each sample. Okay, let me know, Matthew, if you still have a que the question uh, holding there. Do we do this in practice? Well, this would be the most, okay, at least for Jan uh, Lecunz, he says this, is, this should be the way we should all train these networks because by following the gradient for each sample, you maximize what is the noise uh, for update. And so you basically manage to avoid many uh, possible pitfalls. Because by you follow uh, the gradient for each data point, and so this gradient is not necessarily oriented towards the maximum. It's gonna be somehow on average oriented towards the maximum, but you can just get to the maximum by like uh, going like in a, in, a, in, a random, in a random walk. Whereas this point here, this equation here, is always pointing to the maximum. So it turns out this, yeah, it's convenient because it allows you to uh, avoid pitfalls. So do we do this in practice? No. 
So then what did I tell you? Because again, this was the best approach, given that we have wonderful hardware. Unfortunately, we only have uh, GPUs, graphic cards. And so graphic cards are <laughs> making uh, very easy uh, to compute things in parallel. Therefore, only because of the availability of parallel hardware, computing a bunch of gradients altogether is the same as a cost as same, same, same time as computing a single one. So we can compute a few of them altogether. And that's why we are going to be performing usually this mini batch gradient ascent rather than the stochastic gradient ascent. So what is the point here? Uh, gradient, gradient over small set of training example, these mini batches, can be computed in parallel because of graphic cards. So might as well do that instead of a single one, again, just because of the hardware. So again, here we start with a random uh, whatever initial weight. We repeat this for multiple instances. We pick a random subset of the training example. We call this capital J. And now we will update my weight following this small sum, right? Just a few sums of these gradients, right? Because again, I can compute multiple, a few of these uh, gradients all together uh, with the same cost, computational cost, uh, time cost, right? Of computing as a single one over here. So this one, again, uh, allows us also to slightly uh, reduce the noise that the stochastic version brings in. Usually, if you have, let's say, 10 classes, 10 different Ys, right? It might be a good idea to pick J as being a set of 10 samples. And inside, you have a representative of each of them, 10 or 20. So you have, for example, two, two type two examples for each digit, for example. Last slide. Before the last slide, that don't don't get scared. <laughs> I just made the last slide, but it's a bit scary, but not too scary. Questions until this part here. Uh, I think there was a question about epoch and and uh, and uh, for full batch and uh, and and mini batch, right? So epoch again, it means you went through the entire data set. Uh, sometimes you never actually go through the entire data set. You don't even have enough uh, time to finish that. For the batch gradient descent, there is a, an update per epoch. So you have one epoch, you compute all those logs, probabilities, like the gradient of the log probability, you sum them up, you update one weight. So there is going to be exactly one update per epoch in the batch gradient, the gradient ascent. Uh, whereas in the stochastic uh, gradient ascent, there will be as many updates as the number of samples in an epoch, right? So this one, we go through the entire data set one at a, one at a time, like one point at a time, and then we update the weight. Here, it's update weight per epoch instead of per batch. Well, for the batch gradient ascent, there will be one update per epoch. In a stochastic gradient ascent, we'll have one update per data point. In the last part, which is what you're actually referring to, there will be one update per mini batch. Okay, so mini batch, one update per mini batch. Stochastic, one update per data sample. Batch, okay, good. One update per full batch. So you have to go through entire, the whole data set for getting one single update. You can see how much that uh, might be slow. Okay, next slide. Uh, be ready, don't, 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 don't get scary and breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> Let's check how to compute this gradient, okay? All right, I think it's cute. So what will the gradient ascent do in multi-class logistic regression? Let's figure this together. So we start here, right? We said that stochastic, right? Yeah, so we're gonna be trying to figure out how to update the weight following the gradient. Eventually we had to compute this gradient of the log probability. Okay, cool. So let, let's do this together, right? We have that the probability was this uh, soft argmax, which is the probability that for, the, for the, the class assigned to the specific Y for the specific target is going to be the exponentiated um, inner product towards the specific Y divided by the sum of all the exponential. I'll show you that at the beginning of the class, remember? Okay. 
Now we would like to compute first the log, right? So what happens if I compute the log of this thing? Tell me. First of all, it's a, it's a fraction. If you compute the log of a fraction, you're going to get the If I compute the log of a fraction, I will get the difference between, okay, very good. The subtraction of the two terms, very good. So I will take the log of this thing and I get log of the first minus the log of the second. Okay, then second question, what is the log of the first part? What is that? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. See, the, exactly, exactly. Uh, Ethan, I, I got you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, the the log of the of the first part basically uh, removes the exponential. Very good. So you're gonna get just this one. How about the second one? I don't know. So let let me write what you just said. Uh, yes, I understand. I understand that, but I didn't understand the, the answer, your answer. Yes. All right. So let's take the log. We're gonna have the difference. The log of the first thing uh, simplified with the exponential. The log of the second thing doesn't simplify. And then I'm going to have a uh, gradient in front of everything. OK, so it looks like this. Let, let's see whether it is correct or not. I just type it, so <laughs> it could be wrong. So I'm computing the log of this probability, right? This is the probability log of this thing. Then I compute the gradient. So we said that the log simplified with the exponential. Therefore, it disappears, and I have the gradient of the inner product for the correct class. Then I had the subtraction, and then I had the gradient of the log of the sum of the exponentials. OK. What does exp? This is e to the inner product, right? This is exponential. You, you can write as the nepper, nepper number e, right? To the inner product. Does it make sense? Okay. So what happens here? This thing here is going to be uh, the gradient with the with this expression is going to be equal to f of x if I compute the gradient with respect to the omega y. So the first thing means that you have to add f to the correct class omega y. Oh, hold on, hold on, what happens? Just to make sure, is the second equation a definition? Is the second equation, which one is the second equation? This one here where the p, okay. This one, this one we computed, um, we start the class with this one, right? We said we had these scores, and then we had to figure out a way to convert these scores into probabilities. And so given that I have these inner products, I will have as many inner products as the number of classes. And then I have this mapping, right, to get something that is akin a probability. So this is my way of converting a multi-class perception to a multi-class logistic regression. Now we are computing how to update these weights, right? So I want to update these weights by following the gradient of the log likelihood, such that I can maximize the probability that my model assigns to the conditional, the, the probability of y given the x. Hold on, Edison, does it, does it make sense? Did I answer your question? Do you have a question or are you satisfied? Okay, good. All right, sure, fine. How to choose the initial value of W? So, so far we were saying we set it to zero for this, this thing here, for the, for the perception we were setting to zero, we can set it to zero as well. Doesn't matter, we can, set, we can, initial, we can start we can start with zero. It doesn't matter. For single layers, this thing here, logistic regression, right? 
Okay, let's go back to D. Slide with the probability for, with the gradients. Is this by definition? Well, it's not by definition. It's the way I use to convert my scores, these inner products, to probabilities. So we came up with this expression, and then we have that uh, to follow this gradient in order to go uphill, we would like to sum f for the class that has weight w1, right? This W is going to be W for all the possible ways, right? I have the first class, second class, third class, so on. So if I compute the partial derivative, like if I compute the derivative of this thing, right, is a product. I have WY times F, right? If I compute the uh, derivative of this one respect with respect to a variable that is not here, and this become is a constant, right? So the derivative of the gradient with respect to something that doesn't change here would be a constant. The only derivative that actually, the only gradient that matters is the gradient with respect to the wy, the correct class. So in this case, we're gonna be getting that we have to, if we sum the gradient, right, to my w, I will have to sum f to the correct class. Here we understand what's going on. x is the data point, Y is the correct class, the label, the target we have. And then this one is going to be given to us by the model with this expression. This one being the correct class and this one being all possible classes. Okay. So this first term here, if I take the derivative with respect to all possible classes, will be zero. Only the gradient with respect to the correct class will be F. Do we understand this part or not? I know it might be tricky. Okay, Edison understands. How about the rest of the class? There are 56 people more. <laughs> okay, do complain if you're if you're if you're lost. Okay. Okay. I, I will share the slides as well. Okay. Okay, no one complains. Okay, moving forward. Um let, let's so let, let's figure out the second part. So we have the gradient of a log of something, okay? If I take the gradient of the log, what do I get? The, the derivative of a log, what do I get? If I take the, 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 the derivative of, of a log, natural log, one over, very good. Okay, so I will get one over, in this case, the, the, this thing that is on the right hand side, but the derivative is respect to the W. So here I have a function of a function, so there will be also this f popping out. So if I take this uh, derivative, this, this gradient, I will get 1 over this thing, which is this thing here. And then I have the derivative of the summation. So the summation will is going to be all these are constant. Only the, uh, the only thing that doesn't is not constant is going to be the, the derivative with respect to the W is matching the W this summation. So I will call this specific W uh, W Y bar. Okay. And this is the only term that survives the summation. And then after I multiply, these are all possible Y's, right? So I have Y one, two, three, four, five. This is the Y that actually was the one I was computing the gradient with respect to. And so again, finally, then there is this F popping out, right? Function of function. Sweet. So if you notice, is W here a single vector or a metric? Yeah, so W is the all the weights, right? We have as many weights as the number of classes. That's why when you see this expression here, right? This is going to be W1, W2, W3, W4, W5, blah, 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 as many numbers of classes you have. This W is the collection of all those weights, W1, W2, W3, W4. So it's like a... If you want a matrix, I don't think I like to call it a matrix. I, I like to call it a collection, okay? Because if it's a matrix, then it be becomes a little bit uh, tricky to write down. So we can just iterate, right? So you do four for every uh, W in W, right? So you can consider it as being a collection. Okay, does it make sense? But yes, is a what is Y bar? Okay, Y bar is the only surviving term, right? So here inside the W, I have W1, W2, W3, and I call these indexes now, one, two, three, four, eh? Y bar. 
So I have a summation of multiple terms and I take the derivative with respect to one of these terms. All the other terms will die and disappear in the sum. They will be zero. The only term that survives is the one that matches the uh, derivative here, okay? So this is the only surviving term. Now, what is this expression? I think you can tell me what this expression is called in this slide. If you look up, that's PW, yes. That's PW for the Y bar. Huh. Okay, so let me write it here. This is PW for the Y bar multiplied by F. So we want to add F to the correct class WY, and then we would like to subtract, right? We would like to subtract for all weights F, but proportional to the probability that the model gives to that specific class. Okay, so for the correct class, I want to add one F, and then I subtract another F, but spread, you know, with this probability uh, coefficient through all possible classes. So if my model gives me 100% the correct answer, I will sum F and I'll subtract F, right? So if my model is 100% correct, it will only give me 100% uh, the correct answer. I will sum F to the correct answer. I will subtract F from the correct answer. Otherwise, if the model gives me some probability distribution, you will subtract F proportionally to this probability distribution. Remember, this is exactly what we just said in the multi-class uh, perceptron. If you only have the multi-class, you are subtracting to the wrong class, adding to the correct class. Here. I do the same if it's consider uh, only one class is uh, winning and one is you know the one is the wrong class one is the right class I subtract from the wrong I add on the right since it's a probability we have a degree of wrongness or correctness therefore I will subtract my f proportional to the probability of being wrong right to the wrongness of the specific class if my model is 100% correct I sum and subtract the same amount, which means if you sum F and you subtract F, what happens if my model is 100% sure? I don't know if you can catch what's going on here. No, 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 yeah, yeah, answer my question. If I sum F and I subtract F, what do I do? Overall. Okay, nothing. That's that's good. Which was exactly what we were doing in multi-class uh, perception. Remember, you're good. Don't touch it. Right? The perception rule. Are you good? Don't touch. Are you wrong? Subtract to the wrong. Add to the right. Okay. Which is what happens here if you bring back the coldness and 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 crank up the coldness. But again, too much. Instead, in this specific case, there is a degree of being wrong, right? Which is, again, the probability of degree of being right, if you want, which is this probability P that the model assigns to each class. How do we learn? We sum F to the correct weight, and then we subtract F to what? Well, we divide this F in, in parts, and the largest subtraction will be to the wrongest class, right? What is the wrongest class? The one that is having the highest probability. Okay? I hope it makes sense. Just watch this video multiple times, listen multiple times, write down and think through. In the next episode, we're going to see how to compute maybe the derivative for more and more things. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for being with us today.